Airplane, Hollywood versus reality. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Coming up. Hey, 7-4 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 7-4 Gear, is all about aviation. Today I'm here in Nagoya, Japan, and this is the view from my hotel room. Without a doubt, one of the most requested videos I've had is to do a Hollywood versus reality on the 1980s movie, Airplane. And I have a feeling this is gonna be a long video, so let's get into it. Any word on that uh, storm lifting over Salt Lake, Clarence? No, not likely, Victor. I just reviewed the area report for 1,600 hours through 2,400. Uh-huh. It's an occluded front stalled over the Dakotas, backed up all the way to Utah. Yeah, well, if she decides to push over to the Great Lakes, it could get plenty sleepy. Uh-huh. And hey, what about that southern route around Tulsa? I double-checked the terminal forecast and winds aloft. I had far ceilings all the way. Where do they top out? Well, there's some light scattered cover at 20,000, icing around 18. Denver it is. Sorry, Clarence. Latest weather report shows everything socked in from Salt Lake to Lincoln. Oh, hi, Roger. Glad to have you aboard. Victor, this is Roger Murdoch. Victor Basta. How do you do, Roger? Nice to meet you. Roger, I was telling Victor I reviewed the area report for 1,600 hours through 2,400. There's uh, a included front stalled over the Dakotas. First, it's very clear that a pilot was involved in some of the script writing because the phraseology and the terminology that these pilots are using is actually pretty good. Which is kind of surprising because it's a comedy and some of the serious movies are way off in what they say. You hear them talking about some of the different weather things and those are actual things that we think about and look at when we're getting ready to fly. And speaking of weather, these scattered clouds are moving above me so the brightness of this video is going to be changing a lot and there's really not much I can do about it. I know they're making a joke about this guy showing up to wash the windows off of that little elevated thing, but that actually happens. A few months ago I posted this video here on my Instagram of that exact thing happening, so that's actually a real thing. The most Hollywood part of this scene is actually Kareem Abdul-Jabbar standing up on the flight deck with only having to bend over a little bit. I'm six feet tall, I'm not that tall, he's over seven feet tall. I have to crouch a lot of times when I get out of the flight deck, so he would have to be bending over to get in there. So off to a good start, let's get back to airplane. 209 at a ground control. We're loaded and ready to taxi. 209er, taxi to runway 19er. Flight 209er, you are cleared for takeoff. Roger. Huh? LA departure frequency 123.9er. Roger. Huh? Request vector. Over. What? Flight 209er, clear for vector 324. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? First you have the engineer in the back, he's the guy who has two stripes on his jacket. He's, he's making radio calls at the same time the captain is making radio calls. That's not what would happen. You have a pilot flying and a pilot working the radios. You don't have a third guy also jumping in on the radio, so that's very Hollywood. You also wouldn't be given a departure frequency on your takeoff roll. The departure frequency is once you get into the air, you get out of the terminal area of the airport and you get onto someone who's handling bigger airspace. That departure control, usually you'll get on the ground when you pick up your clearance, Clarence, or you'll get it actually up in the air once your plane is moving and you're starting to clean up the aircraft. Once you get up in the air and there's not so much going on. That takeoff portion of a flight is very critical, so that is not the time that you'd be getting that because you'd be wanting to write it down or put it into the radio, and they want you to be paying attention to taking off. However, something that is very accurate is the gear shifter. When you're doing long flights, obviously you want to be as fuel efficient as you can. That gear shifter is what we use for long haul efficiency. Now in the 80s, I didn't think fuel would be a major concern, but clearly they were ahead of their time as far as for making a very fuel efficient flight. So that's what the gear shifter is used for. And just as a point of note, these green lights that you see here on the runway, those are actual. And that lets us know when we're on the runway where we can turn off the runway and onto a taxiway. Sometimes at night when it's dark, it's kind of hard to see exactly where you can turn off. So those green lights let us know this is where we can actually get off of the runway and onto a taxiway. So that's accurate. All right, let's get back to the movie. What 
is it, Doctor? What's going on? I'm not sure. What was it we had for dinner tonight? Well, we had a choice, steak, fish. Yes, yes, I remember. I had lasagna. What did he have? He had fish. Doctor, there are two more sick people, and the rest of the passengers are worried. As many of you have seen on my Instagram stories from time to time, I'm wearing relaxed clothes when I'm doing a very long flight. And clearly, that's what Kareem has decided to do. He decided to put on some Laker shorts because he wanted to get a little bit more comfortable. So, that is accurate. I don't know if I personally would wear such short shorts, but I'm not going to judge him on that. As for the passengers being difficult, I'm sure most flight attendants will agree there are a lot of passengers that will be difficult with the food options. I remember I had lasagna. Usually there's two different options that you can pick from, sometimes three on a very long flight, but those are your only two options on the plane. One other thing to note is you see this artificial horizon here. When you've heard me at the end of all my videos say keep the blue side up, what I'm referring to is this. This blue section here is the upside of the aircraft. We use it when we're flying in weather, when we can't see outside. It lets us know what the airplane is doing, and those are called our instruments. Obviously, if you're doing just normal airline flying, you're always going to want to keep that blue side up. That is, unless, of course, you're flying with Denzel, and he's drunk, and he's decided to go inverted. All right, let's get back to the movie. This is Captain Over speaking. Been a little bumpy up here, but we'll be past it in a few minutes. Uh, a couple points of interest. We're now flying over Hoover Dam, and a little later on, we'll pass just to the south of the Grand Canyon. Meanwhile, relax and enjoy your flight, okay? Chicago, this is flight 209er. We're in trouble. We've got to have all traffic below us cleared, and I want a priority approach and landing in Chicago. Something that is accurate from this time period of the 80s is pilots would make announcements of locations and landmarks. Due to security, pilots generally don't do that anymore. Something that is very accurate is you see that they're dragging these crew members through the aisle. Now that's something that you would want to do, and usually I like to do it by holding their feet, but usually you want to do that so that way it saves you from having to make that very awkward announcement about the co-pilot or the engineer dying. That's just more of a time efficiency thing that you want to do. As far as the captain speaking to Chicago, he is so far away from Chicago that makes no sense at all. What you're going to be talking to is different centers along the way, not to your destination. It also doesn't make sense about him clearing the traffic below him. The only time that you would want to do that is if you couldn't maintain a certain altitude. So for example, in flight, I know I just brought that up, but in flight, he wasn't able to maintain an altitude. In that scenario, you might ask air traffic control for a block of altitude because you're unable to maintain a given altitude. Outside of that scenario, you wouldn't ask for all the traffic beneath you to be cleared because it's totally irrelevant. All right, let's get back to the movie. Dr. Room, Mr. Hammond ate fish, and Randy said there are five more cases, and they all had fish too. Yeah, the co-pilot had fish. What did the navigator have? He had fish. All right. Now we know what we're up against. Every passenger on this plane who had fish for dinner will become violently ill in the next half hour. Just how serious is it, Doctor? Extremely serious. Starts with a slight fever, dryness of the throat. As the virus penetrates the red blood cells, the victim becomes dizzy. Begins to experience an itching, a rash. From there, the poison goes to work on the central nervous system, causing severe muscle spasms, followed by the inevitable grueling. At this point, the entire digestive system collapses, accompanied by uncontrollable flatulence, until finally the poor bastard is reduced to a quivering, wasted piece of jelly. Something that's very Hollywood in this scene is that you see the fish that he was served had the head of the fish still attached. On a typical airliner, you will never see that. The other thing that you will never see if you become a pilot is the captain not fully eat all of his dessert. So those two things are very Hollywood. Another very Hollywood thing is that he's putting a lot of control inputs in the yoke. You see, he's got it banked all the way over to the side. If that was happening in real life, the plane would be rolling over. So that also is very Hollywood. Something that is accurate though is it does take the autopilot on some aircraft one or two seconds to actually grip and get a hold of the aircraft. So the fact that it's taking two, three seconds for your autopilot to inflate and take over, that's accurate. 
Typically, what I like to do is when I engage the autopilot, I give it a couple seconds, I make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's fully inflated and doing its job, and then you can release your hands from the yoke. Don't just hit the button and think, now it's gonna be just fine, because it may not. Also, they're already in the cruise portion of their flight, which is usually the longest portion, and the autopilot for me is always engaged by this point. There's no reason for you to be flying straight and level for a long time because you're just holding onto the yoke and the corrections from the autopilot are generally gonna be better and smaller than if you're doing it and you can kind of look out the window. If you're there hand flying it, you're also making the other guy work a lot more. So that's kind of Hollywood or I'm just lazy, one of the two. Okay, let's get back to airplane. Now Elaine, right next to the throttle is the airspeed gauge. What speed does it indicate? 520 miles per hour. Good, very good. Now, check your altitude. That's the dial just below and to the right of the airspeed indicator. 35,000 feet. No, wait, 34,000 feet. No, it's dropping. It's dropping fast. Why is it doing that? Oh, my God, the automatic pilot, it's deflating. Well, hey, don't panic. On the belt line of the automatic pilot, there is a hollow tube. Now that is the manual inflation nozzle. Pull it out and blow on it. So now you know the real reason that we have the door to the flight deck always locked. They told you it was 9-11, but it's actually this. I knew it! Something that is very Hollywood in this scene though is she's talking about the speed in miles per hour. There are some aircraft that use miles per hour, but generally aircraft of this size use knots. And up at that altitude, they use what's called a Mach number. So if you're doing 0.84, Mach 0.84, you're doing 84% of the speed of sound. So at this altitude, when the plane is in cruise, you're talking about Mach number, not miles per hour. That's just something I thought you should know. Okay, let's get back to the movie. Can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Well, I flew single engine fighters in the Air Force, but this plane has four engines. It's an entirely different kind of flying. Mr. Stryker, I know nothing about flying, but there's one thing I do know. You're the only one on this plane who can possibly fly it. You're the only chance we've got. So there's a saying that I've heard from some older pilots, a plane is a plane is a plane. And basically what that means is all airplanes have the same or similar characteristics. For example, if you've never flown a plane and I've never flown an Airbus, but of the two of us, I'm probably more likely to be able to safely get that airplane on the ground. So the same is here. He is the only pilot that's on the aircraft, even though he's never flew anything except fighters, it does make sense that he would have the best chance of getting that plane safely on the ground. So that's accurate. Obviously our control panel is large and comprehensive as it shows in this video. There's a lot of different gauges there and that's why it takes us months to learn how the systems work. However, something that is very Hollywood is that we don't have a purple light. There is no such thing on a purple light. We have cyan, which is the color of some of our newer displays on newer aircraft, but there are no purple lights. So that's very Hollywood. All right, let's get back to the movie. All right, I'm going to unlock the automatic pilot. Just remember the controls will feel very heavy compared to a fighter. Now don't worry about that, it's perfectly normal. Now one more thing. There's somebody there who can work the radio and leave you free for flying. Yes, the stewardess is here with me. Good. 
Ever sit in the co-pilot seat? Elaine, we want you to sit in the co-pilot seat. The radio's all yours now. And keep an eye on that number three engine gauge over there. It's running a little hot. Stryker, before we start, I'd like to say something. There's no reason why you shouldn't have complete confidence in your chances to come out of this thing alive and in one piece. If you haven't seen this movie, and I'll put a link to it in the description below if you do want to see it, but if you haven't seen the movie, Ted is a nervous flyer. He used to be a military pilot, and now he is very scared to fly. So this scene makes a lot of sense and is probably very accurate because he's flying with his emotional support animal. Now, there wasn't a very common thing in the 80s, but that just shows you just how advanced and ahead of its time this movie was. Sadly, I have put in requests to fly with an emotional support animal myself, but all my requests have been denied. Another scene that Hollywood got very accurate here is that the first officer is assaulting the flight attendant. And if you're a new flight attendant or planning to become one, all I'm going to say is, be careful, because the first officers can be some real creepers. Something that is very Hollywood, though, from this scene is you see the first officer fly to the ceiling and the flight attendant fly to the ground. It looks like the plane noses over, and there's something called a negative G. And when you do that, basically, you push the nose of the aircraft over and everything flies up. You're weightless. Now, how do I know about this? Well, I read about it, of course, when I was in flight school. I would never take an empty plane and nose it over just to see everything fly up into the air. I would never do that. The a little hot button is definitely something you want to pay attention to while you're flying. Hollywood did get that correct. And so that's definitely something that's flashing and that draws your attention to it. So if you're ever flying and you see a little hot button, just make sure that you're paying attention to that gauge until that button extinguishes. All right, let's get back to airplane. All right, Stryker, you better stay up there for a bit. As soon as the fog lifts, we'll bring you in. I'll take it, Elaine. Listen to me, Kramer. Dr. Rumack says the sick people are in critical condition, and every minute counts. We've got to land now. Don't be a fool, Stryker. You know what a landing like this means you more than anybody. I'm ordering you to stay up there. No dice, Chicago. I'm giving the orders and we're coming in. I guess the foot's on the other hand now, isn't it, Kramer? I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. All right, now just listen carefully. You should be able to see the runway at 300 feet. Aim a touchdown a third of the way along. Slight crossmen from the right, so be ready for it. If you land too fast, use your emergency brakes. Red handles right in front of you. If that doesn't stop you. If that doesn't stop you. Cut the four ignition switches over the co pilot's head. So, this has never happened to me, but something that I've heard from a few friends that I've flown with is Bill Murray, when he is on your flight, he'll usually ask the flight attendants if he can come talk to the pilots. And because it's Bill Murray, who's going to say no to Bill Murray? but that he usually comes up, puts his head up into the flight deck, and says, I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. And again, I've never had it happen to me, but I've heard it from a few different pilots. He's such a legend. Something else that's very accurate is that if your landing is going bad, instead of doing a rejected landing like you get taught in flight school, also known as a go-around, it's important to just kill all your engines and then just put the plane on the ground. It'd be silly to go around when you're so close to the ground. Just kill your engine and put it on the ground. That makes a lot of sense and is very accurate. Another very accurate thing is that you see this woman attacking the pilot. Now, that just goes to show you that when you upgrade and become a captain, you're getting assaulted instead of assaulting others. If you're a pilot or you're planning to go to the airlines, it's very important that you study and be ready for upgrade so you can start getting assaulted instead of assaulting others. All right, let's get to the final scene of airplane. He's up on the front. Watch for that crosswind. Level it out. Aim for the numbers. Let the dip your left wing. They're drifting. Keep your eyes on the far end of the runway. You're too low, damn it. Watch your stall speed. Down! Down! The brake! Hold the red handle! I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. 
tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. Something that's very accurate here, if you are a pilot or you're currently in flight school, is that the captain is yelling unlimited amount of instructions to Ted, uh, the pilot who's flying the plane, and that pilot, Ted, is just trying to get the plane onto the runway. What it reminds me of is every flight instructor yelling at a student a million different things while that student is literally just happy to get it somewhere on that runway. Another thing that's accurate and most people don't know about it, it's called the free floating yoke. You see that yoke moving up and down as well as left and right and forward and back. That's a three-dimensional yoke. Most people don't know about it. I actually don't have it installed on the 747 and it's a little unfortunate, but it's a three-dimensional yoke. So if you ever see one, now you'll know what it is. Of course, I couldn't finish this Hollywood versus reality without talking about the engines making the noise of a propeller. What most people don't know is on a typical commercial aircraft, the engines are called turbofans. And those fans make a jet sound but they also make a propeller sound because the front fan of that engine is acting like a propeller. So that's actually what you're hearing in this video. So that's actually very real. Hollywood got that right. Something that they got very Hollywood though is you wouldn't let a passenger get up right in the middle of landing to go talk to the pilots. Even if you were Bill Murray, it's still not gonna happen. If you enjoy films from this era, you're going to love the Hollywood versus reality that I did on Catch Me If You Can. If you haven't seen it, I'll put a link to it right here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.